All right, we're live. Welcome to the Beat Sessions. I am your host, Mitchell Weary. Thank you for tuning in. I uh, want to extend my thanks to those of you who joined me last week. I, uh, you know, uh, I'm just getting started in this process. So if you didn't see the video, it's because I accidentally didn't make it public. It was uh, private while I was live broadcasting. So if you went back and rewatched it, I certainly do appreciate that. Very kind of you. Um, and so, yeah, it looks like uh, we're public and things are going all right here. I do need to uh, adjust something here real quick. this down just a little so far so good huh yeah you know nice you're the producer yourself too i like it i haven't even introduced you and you're busting my balls already i know i'm trying to get all that all the insults out before <laughs> you utter my name <laughs> <laughs> all right i think i think we're looking good now yeah all right that voice that you've been hearing harass me is my good friend <laughs> director grant nelson how you doing buddy welcome to the studio i'm good doing really good thanks for joining me uh so you can probably probably see where we're going with this uh him being a film director and all this conversation is going to focus on film and music and the beautiful combination of both I would definitely say that I'm more of a music person, but if I had to make an argument, I'd probably say you're definitely more of a film guy. Yeah, I'm more of a film guy, music second. So let's let's just uh, dive right into it. Let's talk yeah. about uh, how you got your start. Like, what uh, what were the films that um, I guess inspired you? Um, what were the what were the things in your life that inspired you, or the people that inspired you? Oh, my parents. My parents were super into just movies in general. So my mom was super into horror films. So I got into horror films, and my dad was really into you know like the big bigger like uh cult movies or just like really well you know n known movies like clockwork orange and stuff like that and then that's all we do is just sit around and watch movies all day so it's kind of hard to uh avoid that career are either of them filmmakers themselves no not even close they're artists in their own way and they do a lot of artwork but you know they had that nailed and i was like yeah they both know how to draw so i'm just gonna do something else so i went and made movies so what uh like around what age would you say like you really like started getting into it, started pursuing, you know, your own personal projects? Oh like, man, I'm a late bloomer. So, jeez, uh, late twenties, maybe like twenty nine or something like that. Lid. No, 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 that's a lie. What am I talking about? Probably like twenty five. Uh, time gets weird when you get to 37. Wait, I, I know, man. I'm uh, I'm right there with you. I just always, anytime somebody asks me something, I'm like that happened like ten years ago. So yeah, I mean, I was like twenty five, so like twelve years now. That's good. Oh, I, that's uh, that's crazy. I mean, was there was there anything that you were into before that like let like like hobbies, uh, interests, like anything artistically, especially? Yeah, I used to be into I make sculptures and stuff like that, and I was always into like creating board games and stuff. So I always had creative inclinations. Big word. Um, <laughs> but for me, thanks for throwing those out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for throwing those out there, big guy. <laughs> you have to Google those words. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just took a while for me to finally get into film through an internship I did, honestly, uh, in film school. I kind of was like, the guy kind of just told me, he was like, why aren't you, why aren't you making your own movies? I'm like, I didn't think I was allowed to do that. And then, so I just went and did it and here we are. So I'm, I'm curious, what was, uh, so, I mean, roughly 10 years ago, what was, what was the film like, or what, what was oh, it that, uh, movie you can YouTube, it's on there somewhere. It's like a short film called, uh, Stasis. And that was just like a really, really short film I did, like five minutes long, and I started making that. And then my producer, or my, uh, my, uh, the guy I did the internship for, what is that? Mentor. He is a mentor. Oh, yeah. So yeah. anyways, yeah, he just like, you know, told me that it was really good, and he put it in his film festival, and he's like, you should just keep trying to make more movies. So I was like, okay, cool. So he kind of like pushed me to, and he became my producer at the time, and, and then we just made uh, Day of the Dead together. What, what was the, I mean, what was the... The catalyst that that pushed you into into filmmaking, like like right around the time you got interested in it, was I mean, like was it a specific movie that you saw? Like, oh, did man. you just did you just notice over time that you started appreciating the medium and and wanted to get into it, or like how did that work out for you? I just I yeah, like I always need a creative outlet, and so 
and I love film, and it's just like sculpting got boring. <laughs> yeah, sculpt, and it got yeah, I got boring, and then they started to like fall apart and stuff too. So I was like, you know what? If I put something on DVD, maybe it won't fall apart so easily. Well, and you're a uh, you're a pretty decent filmmaker. I definitely Thank enjoyed. You. Uh, what's the what's the film that you have on Amazon? Is that still Amazon Prime? On Amazon? Um, yeah. Well, I guess you got to rent it now, but it's still on there. You can rent it. Um, Date of the Dead. Date of the Dead, yeah. which was uh, fairly entertaining, um, especially because it, it's <laughs> it entertaining. Yeah. One, of, one of one of the actresses you used as a as a girl that I used to see. So that was oh yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that was especially cool. entertaining. Yeah, no, she's a she's a wonderful uh, wonderful woman. Yeah, but uh, no, I I mean I w- I found that movie immensely entertaining. I I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like your your style of horror is kind of like. A little campy in the sense of you know trying to trying to create like a, a style that's scary but also funny you know and yeah and yeah I can't help but make things funny like the movie I'm doing right now Sweet Dreams is got real serious like uh, subject matter but then there's a bunch of just weird you know like comedy in it too I just can't really take anything too seriously. So are you a uh, are you a big fan of like Evil Dead? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah in those yeah, franchises. For sure. yeah. That's uh, like Day of the Dead is definitely like a. You know, has a lot of influence from uh, the Evil Dead and that series. I was, I was going to say, if you want to check out uh, Grant's new movie, um, you can go ahead and point up your your left finger there. The uh, the Instagram nice. name is right there. Um, yeah, no, I uh, the Evil Dead. I mean, that's uh, I love those movies. We used to uh, like we hang out and have dinners before cross country meets in high school, and we'd always throw on. Just scary movies or whatever, and Evil Dead pretty much came up about half the time. Whether it was one man, or two. it's so easy to put on because it's funny. It's and it's really fun movie too, and it's scary. It's got everything, man. That's a perfect movie. Have you? Uh, Bruce Campbell's doing uh, like they have like a newer series, right? They uh, yeah, it, it was really good. It's canceled now. But, I mean, it's really good. Oh, that's <laughs> sorry. No, that's, that's it's really good though. I mean, it went like three seasons. I thought that was totally okay. I mean, I mean maybe that's. Two. But it was fine for me. I was like, it's, that was that was good. It didn't really need to keep going. It got what it needed to do. I thought it was it's really funny and it's really encapsulates the the show or the the movie. It's it's really good. I feel like that's pretty much the the lifeline you get from Netflix or any streaming mm-hmm. service these days. Like you're <laughs> couple seasons. Of stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's hard man, and especially that plot or that kind of like storyline. It's like how many seasons can you have of? Uh, Deadites keep coming back and him fighting him off. It's really cool, but it's like, I don't know. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think there's, and I mean, speak to this as a filmmaker, I mean, you haven't dabbled in TV, I don't think, but, you know, there's something to be said about film. I mean, you have you have that just tight span of time, and you have to fit the concept and the story into that. And, you know, as glorious as it is to, to have a big TV series with a bunch of content, I mean, there's a lot of really good ones that we've seen just go south yeah. real fast towards the end. Uh, a lot of shows I like, I have to be like, all right, I'm going to stop at like mid-season because it's going too long. What is what is your favorite show that you just cannot stomach towards the back end these days? Oh, man. Um, I mean, like Simpsons. I can't believe that thing is still going on. Really? You're yeah. not... I mean, so I don't... It's not a show that I've watched a, a ton of my life. I appreciate it, but I, I mean, I haven't seen the newer episodes. They're, they're just... Not up to snuff, um, or I, I hear they're still like funny, but like they're just not perfect like they used to be. So I'm like, I only want perfection from Simpsons. So. <laughs> well, I mean, they're you know they have a reputation of being fairly prescient. I mean, maybe 20 years down the road, they're I don't know. Maybe they're making predictions right now that that'll come true too, and we'll end up having this conversation down the road. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> it'll exactly. be just as good, you know. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not watching them. Maybe they're perfect. Maybe they're great. And I'm just like, no. What uh, what are you watching right now? Uh, uh, I just uh, I just got Spartacus on Blu-ray. I'm pretty excited about that. Oh one, my I god! I it's, love Spartacus. It's uh, is that Sparta? Yeah, am I am I thinking of uh? It's like the super like violent like. No, it's super yeah, violent. Yeah. Boobies everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, good. All right. Yeah. I have, I, I Foul mean, language. I remember seeing the first okay. season. That the first season featured the act that it was an uh, Australian actor that that died after yep, the first season. Exactly right? Okay, it, yeah. so same show. Okay, yeah. Which is crazy that it went on for four seasons after the main actor died. I think they did a great job with how of like keeping the show going and making it a good show even without the, the star of the show dying, which is crazy. 
I mean, I only uh, I only saw the first episode, so I or yeah. I mean the uh, the first season. So I mean uh, that's the the one with uh, Lucy Law or the, yeah Lucy Law. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good. I I love it, but I'm a sucker for blood and boobs. So well, no, I mean, you know, it can't be stuff like that if it's. It, I mean, if that's the concept, if that's what they're going for, then, oh, they're going for it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you it's get exactly. What it's kind of about. like uh, oh my gosh, I read the uh, I read the I mean I didn't read all of it because it was just so dumb I had to. I had to pass over it, but I clicked on it out of curiosity because it was talking about a, and it was actually a YouTube video that this person made, and they were like, all the arguments against why Starship Troopers suck. So they were like, I mean, like looking at it from like a super technical, logical standpoint, I'm like, dude, you're missing yeah, that the, is not a you're missing like that. the point. I just watched that again like days ago. <laughs> that movie's great, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, Paul Verhoeven, like, man, that director, he uh, he's awesome. His movies are always like. That same style, Showgirls, Terminator, or not Terminator, sorry, uh, Robocop. Robocop, yeah. Recall. They all just like gore and boobs and violence. And it's like, it's not taking itself seriously either. It's just like, it can't be. Yeah. Starship Troopers, definitely. Well, I mean, Showgirls especially. I mean, I don't. I need to watch it again. It's been too long. Man, I... I've been thinking about it a lot for some reason. <laughs> I mean, for <laughs> for obvious reason. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> do you ever stop thinking about it? I really don't. I mean, uh, it, it just reminds me of Saved by the Bell. Poor, uh, poor Screech, rest in peace. Oh, it's, yeah, uh, that was recent. That yeah, was... Uh, I like it. But, I mean, I remember, like, we're, we're at that age. Like, we remember that was, like, that was wild because, like, Saved by the Bell ended. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it was, like, you know... Elizabeth Berkey, you know, Jesse Spano it lost her mind. Deal. It was like it was like the I'm so excited episode, yeah. like times a million. It was Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the ridiculous scene in the pool. I mean that just uh, do you remember that? The uh I need to rewatch it again. Oh man. She just goes absolutely ballistic in this I love pool. It. Uh, that movie is so over the top. It's it's insane. It's I like insane. insanity. It really helps. The movie's not that good. As long as you're, like, insane, it's like, cool, I'll, I'll go with it. I just watched Gremlins 2. That movie's insane. Yeah. And it's just fun. How much of, uh, I mean, as a, as a filmmaker, how much of, uh, how much do you kind of, like, chuckle at people's criticisms? I mean, I, I feel like you have a, a... I'm pretty good at it, luckily, because, man, there, if you uh, if you look at my Amazon Prime, like, the comments, it's like, the reviews, there's a couple that are just like... They're just really mean, like not even like like personal attacks on me, which is like it's not even. And then they'll they'll follow it up with, "It was not a bad movie. It actually had some good stuff in it." But then there's just like personal insults, and I'm like, "But I I don't care. I think it's funny. I actually I put I, I made a T-shirt of one of the comments, and I, I made a T-shirt out of it." Well, I mean, I think uh, you know, you and I have uh, have had that conversation that you know, this show or your films or, or whatever, like, you know, we don't, we don't do this to seek personal validation from anybody. Like, if you don't like it, you don't like it. Yeah. You know, I, I make stuff for, yeah. that I like. Yeah. You know, you know I, I mean, I, I would hate uh, it if at the end of the day, I'm like, people like it, but I'm like, it's not really my cup of tea. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I hope you all like this show. I, I hope you're enjoying it when you're watching it. I, I promise you I'm getting faster internet. So if it looks a little rough, it'll, it'll be better next week. I promise. But, but yeah, man, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, describe um, you're 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 someone I was really happy to get on the show because um, you know you're kind of uh, I shouldn't say kind of you're definitely that that independent filmmaker where a lot of your projects like you're handling that stuff, you're managing that stuff, and for yeah, I do everything. Yeah, I mean for the for the person who's you know trying to break into filmmaking or you know even just trying to get their own project off the ground, like what. I mean, what are the steps? Is there like a logical pro logical progression to to that process? I mean, how do you how do you go about, and how has your process changed? You know, with you know, with the learning yeah. that, that you've acquired through. Um, I mean, the way I started out, which I think is good, just go write a script because it doesn't cost you any money. Just go write a script, get a, get some storyboards going. You can do that yourself, and it's the beauty of storyboarding is it's supposed to look like crap. So if you actually overdo it, it's like it just complicates it. It's supposed to be just stupid stick figures and just garbage, um, just so you can get your point across. So yeah, just find a friend, you know, get somebody that knows that has a camera. That's a big plus. That's what I did. I just found a friend. And I was like, hey, are you doing anything with your camera? Let's let's go film some. Um, yeah, it's the best way. Just get a script because people don't write scripts and people, students and stuff are like hungry to make movies, but there's nothing to film if you don't have a script. So it's like get out there, make your own script, and then. People will come. Yeah, I mean, is there uh, any advice in that process? I mean, I've I've written a, 
a couple before. You have, and I've read yeah, them. yeah, you've uh, you've seen uh, you've seen one of mine at least. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily the uh, easiest type of document to write, but then no, again, I would it isn't. I would also encourage people like like you said, you know, it's the it's the most important part in that beginning process, and it's like it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to look exactly like a professional script. Like you're not yeah, make a short film too. You know, yeah. my my first two short films. I sorry, the only short films I've ever made. Uh, they both don't have any dialogue. It's just easier. It's like, hey, I don't know if I can get good actors. Uh, so because like I had to act in one of my movies because I was like I couldn't find it. I didn't know how to like get actors. So I was like, yeah, I'll just do the acting. And I'm like, there's no dialogue, so that'll be easy. So just get your story across as simple as you can without having and make it simple. Keep it somewhere where you know you can film. So when I'm writing scripts, I'm always thinking, like, where is a location I can utilize? You know, I don't write a script and go, it's some fantastical place I'm not going to have access to. So, like, in my movie right now, I wrote a scene for a library, even though I was like, I have no idea how to do that. and Because I went against my own judgment. I was like, you know, I don't know how to. I, I just always wanted to have a library scene. So I was like, I'm just going to do it. And then now it's like, I was like, I just gave up on trying to get access to a library. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to rewrite it into a location that I actually have. So, Well, uh, I, I want to, uh, I definitely want to talk, um, you know, just about the general process of, of your new film and, and how that differs from, from previous projects. But uh, you talk about logistics now, like, I mean, what's it been like trying to make a film with people with COVID going on? Oh, yeah. Like, that's... It I mean, was it was a weird journey, and we're still in it, man. That thing never ends. Um, but it was, man. It at some things are worse, some things are better. Because when it first started, I was not working, so I'm like, all right, cool. I I was gonna planning on taking all this time off anyways. Now I have unemployment, and everybody's available, which is the hardest part about making movies is trying to, especially when you're not paying people, yeah, or just paying them a little bit. It's like trying to get their availability it's like because it's unfair to be like just take two weeks off of work you know it's hard so everybody in the pandemic they're bored they want to do something um airbnbs were super easy to get and uh everybody had some money so they were fine working for free it was pretty opportunistic yeah i I think uh, i think i remember you saying something along the lines of that if uh i mean obviously your actors have to be comfortable with uh with we, venturing yeah. out and, and interacting we but had I mean, to be care- yeah that was a thing you know like temperature checks at the door and like you know wearing our masks from time to time and like just making sure everybody's okay and everything like that but man we didn't have we didn't have one scare we had one oh sorry we had one scare. <laughs> one guy got it like and but he let me know he's like yeah i had it so give me another you know like week or so and then i'll be fine so that worked out fine but man we were pretty fortunate no incidences, really. So well, and and generally speaking, I mean, um, you know, the the production process. I mean, so the, let's just talk about this this new film uh, specifically. I mean, how much how much are, are you doing on your own? Like, I, I know you wrote it, you're directing it. Um, you know, what what other involvement are you having? I, I assume you're probably editing it. Yeah, I'm um, editing it. I was editing it uh, this morning. Oh, so, fair enough. Yeah. So <laughs> any free time I have, I'm like, well, I'll do a little bit more editing. Yeah, and it just to uh, I mean, just to give uh, the viewer an idea of like what I mean, how many hours a week are you spending? You know, between uh, with all the man, processes. Yeah. I mean, there's so many processes. I like to take everything step by step. So once I'm done with this, like a rough edit, then I'll start doing the sound. And I have a guy. I have an intern right now, which is weird, but that's awesome. Um, though. Yeah, Scott. He lives in uh, Phoenix, so so I have to like. And I have terrible internet access in my house, so I have to like send him files. It's a little frustrating. Dude, but, cheers to that. But uh, <laughs> having interns, cool. Sound, and it makes me sound uh, impressive to me at least. So uh, it's cool. And I mean, it's uh, it's funny. Like you looking at the process, I, I think uh, I don't want to make an assumption about like the way people think, but I, I mean, I think there's probably a thought process out there that you know filmmaking is a linear process, and it's definitely not. And there's definitely, and especially with the way you can interact, you know, via, you know, online communication these days, you know, it's it's much easier to, I guess, you know, send film files to edit to someone in Phoenix and, yeah. and pass that work off. And, I mean... And everything's to, in, you know, like, um, I don't know, user-friendly where, you know, everything kind of like, their software is going to work with mine for the most part and everything. It's, it's, it's a good time to live in to make independent movies. A lot of software, a lot of free software that'll help you out. It's pretty great. 
So talk about, um, I, I'm curious as far as like how, uh, how does the process work? So let's just say the, the brand new filmmaker, they've, you know, they've, they've gone through this process and, and they've gotten to where you're at. Um, you know, how do you, how do you start by approaching, you know, uh, Amazon or a streaming service to, to get your film like on there is, is that a difficult process oh, it's a really good question because i have no clue that's why i have a producer for her. uh <laughs> usually i can do everything on my own and i get like most of the things done on my own for you know like you know everybody helps out and does you know obviously the crew and everything is like and the, you know my dp is awesome but you know i have to do mostly everything and it's like but that end of it i'm like i just tell them like go go get it done so my my old producer david pike i'm like I don't know how he got it on Amazon Prime, but it got up on Amazon Prime. And my new producer, I'm just, please get it on something, you know. I mean, so. I mean, you're only one man. There's, I mean, I feel like there's only so much that yeah, you can do. Yeah, and those are the kind of things that I hate, like any kind of like paperwork or stuff like that. I'm like, <laughs> I hate it. But if I can just have my software and I'm like, I can just sit at home and do this myself, then I'll do it. But like, man, trying to get on a streaming service, I'm like, I have no idea. I guess you have to contact them. I hate making phone calls or emailing, so I'm like, just please somebody else do it for me. Talking to, talking gear a little bit here. Do you have a um, do you have a favorite camera that you use now or that you used in the past? Um, We're using a Black Magic right now, which seems to be really nice. We're getting some uh, really good footage off of it, shooting 4K. Um, yeah, I'm not more, I'm not much of a specs guy, but that Black Magic is nice. It's really good. I like it a lot. It's affordable. Um, Easy to use, small. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I was kind of uh, gonna to build on that as far as you know, like the the brand new filmmaker, um, you know, trying to, especially on a budget. Like I've I've been dealing with that, trying to build my studio. You know, obviously lighting isn't perfect. You're uh, still sitting on milk crates. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but you can't see those milk crates. So. No, it's uh, you uh, and your posture is nice, man. So I uh, is it really? Yeah, oh, yeah, nice. absolutely. You're you're, you're, like you're only, looking sharp. That's the only compliment I got in high school. My teachers. I was not a good student or anything, but they did say I, for some reason, I had good posture in class. Just like I sat up straight better than anybody. Yeah, like all of y'all. That's a weird thing. That's all I remember. Yeah. High school was like positive reinforcement. It was like it's not, posture. man. The rest of us are gonna have scoliosis, and you're just gonna be, you know, chilling there. Oh man, you should see me driving my car. Like, up, up right, drinking your Bud Budweiser. Yeah, I'm like I drive like this. It's pretty bad. But it's good, I guess. I don't know. I don't look very cool <laughs> to girls passing by. I don't look very cool, dude. Uh, we're we're thirty seven. There's not much that we can do to look cool these days. I don't it's, think it's not. <laughs> <It's tough. laughs> the struggle's real, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, you know we uh, you talk about being old. Let's uh, let's take it back a little bit. The glory days a little bit. I want to uh, I want to talk about um, music in film. Um, how it's um, how it's I, I guess guided your creativity as far as the way you make, make films, if it has. Um, I mean, there's there's a, a whole number of, of fun subjects that, uh, that I want to touch on here with nice. you. I guess, uh, I mean, go, go ahead and start off. I mean, what, uh, you know, where where is music uh, for you as far as the filmmaking process? I mean, how much, uh, how much stock do you put into it, into your own films? How much does it oh, mean to you man. when you're watching a film? It's terrible, but like, because I don't know how to make music, which is... I don't like to not have any control over a subject, um, but it's so important in movies. There's always those movies that you watch, and you're like, this score is so beautiful and so great, and it's like, what would the movie be like without that score and without that? Like Jaws, it's like, what would, the, what would that movie be like without the, the you know, iconic music that comes along with it? And it's like, and it, that's scary, because in my new movie, because uh, the... Music for Day of the Dead is good and it's okay, but it's like it's a it's a horror comedy. It doesn't need to have great sound. But this new movie, it's like, man, I know how important music is, and I'm gonna have to be. It's gonna be a tough challenge trying to get that one scored. Well, I'm uh, I'm glad that you uh, you mentioned Jaws because that's probably nice. my it's probably my favorite score. I think it's and really I, great. It just it really um, great. you know it's it, it not not that it's just so iconic and so recognizable, but it um you know the it it's just a it's a sound it's a melody that evokes fear like this yeah. it sounds terrifying I mean I and it's a horror film with an orchestral um, sound score which is a little unusual but it works out really nicely um I and it's funny too because I I 
I definitely feel like definitely feel like some of the some of the better scores come from horror films. I mean, I feel like a big part of yeah, like more they have a lot of very iconic because I mean, like horror films. If you, I was thinking about this earlier today, when you was, think of the horror franchises out there, they all have a. I mean, like yeah, they they all have like a iconic theme to them. You know, Friday the Thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street. They all have their their set piece that they use in every movie. You know, so. I think it's pretty important. If you want to have a franchise horror film, I think you need a, a good theme. We're talking about uh, you and I were talking about John Carpenter leading into mm. leading into the show this week. What so did uh, yeah? What you what you think of that new record? Uh, yeah, it's really good. I've been listening to it a lot. It's just it works at because I've been listening to his other albums too, other sound scores for the other movies like Halloween and stuff, and they're they're nice, but they don't. It's hard to just kind of sit down and just listen to it straight through, whereas uh, the album we were listening to, um, what's it called like uh, Hidden Themes, Lost Lost Themes. Oh, are you talking about the uh, the Thurston Moore record? Yeah, or, or the new uh, the new John Carpenter. Oh, the, oh yeah, the new John Carpenter is called uh, yeah Lost Themes. Yeah, Lost Themes was yeah. really good, but it it works. It flows as more of like an album where it's just kind of like every song kind of goes mixes well into the next. It's really nice. You had a chance to listen to that Thurston Moore record, right? No, I did not. No, all right. Find it on Spotify. It's uh oh, it's on. Uh, it's only on Bandcamp right mm. now. It's uh, that's what it was. He told me to. But it's uh, yeah, no, I mean, um, you build on a really good point here. Um, you know, I, I I like the Carpenter record. It was interesting. It didn't. Um, I, I don't really feel like it as an album progressed and told a story the way the Thurston Moore record does. Okay. Um, the Thurston Moore record is. Uh, let me just. Uh, I'll just pull it up here. It's. Uh, the the track progression, I mean, it's it's I like I just I love the way he basically sets the scene, but it's still you know it's um, it's all instrumental. Okay. So I mean, it, it basically it plays like a film noir. He talks about that um, and and what he you know thematically was looking for on the record. But um, wow. let me the oh my goodness the dogs are going nuts. <laughs> I'm eyeballing those beers. I think I'm gonna. I think you should. I think you should definitely it. snag one. But we're uh, we're stalling the this, this show here. But no. So it's it, it. But it's a it's a it's a builds on a sequence of events. So it's like, um, you know the the station and then the the ride and uh, the home, the addict, the neighbor, and you know. It, but it's it's really cool because it it's it's not something that you can just throw on and casually listen to at any time. But conceptually. I really liked the way, you know, he puts you in a spot, but then the listener is basically kind of on their own to have their own experience with it. And I think that's the cool thing about the Carpenter record and just, um, you know, music like his and, you know, instrumental soundtrack music is that uh, the title becomes such a, a big part of it, more so than... Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, you know, like your average pop star or rock and roller that can be like, oh, this is my new hit single, Untitled. You know, whatever it'll roll, but like you know, with, with I mean, with these tracks on here, I'm looking at like Weeping Ghost, the second song. Yeah, that, that's a yeah, yeah, yeah. dope track. I mean, yeah, it, it sounds really like I remember Weeping Ghost. It sounds like something that like Trent Reznor would use, or like Rob Zombie would use. I mean, it's yeah. like I mean, he really kicks it up in its cool. And way. I like that because I don't think it, I don't think these the lost themes are based off of a film or anything. They're just like his own music, I think. Um, so when I hear those titles and listen to music, it's like I like to imagine what movie this would be in or what scene, what kind of a scene it would be in. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I mean, I, I would say that that is definitely probably my favorite thing about, uh, about a project like this is that, um, again, like the, the music creates an emotion. It, it, it stirs you in a certain way, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're definitely left to, to have your own experience and, yeah. and, and, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's a, a lot that gets just lost in the, the lyrical experience. Yeah, I agree with the the lyrics. Like when lyrics are kind of thrown in there, I get a little bit more distracted, and I start thinking about it, the music a little bit more. But when it's just those, you know, it's just no no uh, no uh, vocals, I can kind of just tune out and just kind of like close my eyes and imagine like the scene or what's going on, you know. So uh, talking about talking about vocals and songs, let's talk about the difference between um, a song in a movie and a and a score. I mean. Do you do you lean one way or another? I mean, are you like based on your uh, your taste in film? I mean, do you? Prefer, I, I, do you I guess if I had to choose, I'd pick a score over just a song. 
Why? The songs are nice, but a score kind of just gives more. Well, more for like, because I I tend to gear towards more like horror, and horror doesn't usually have too many like songs in it. It's more just a score to it. Yeah. So it, it kind of like just makes you focus more on the mood and the feeling of the movie, whereas a song is like, oh, I like that song a lot, and it kind of it it might take you out of the movie a lot a little bit, even though it's a really good song. I don't know. What about um? I mean, what about your favorite? Films outside of the horror genre. I mean, do you uh, like what, what? What are some of your uh, what are some of your favorite films? Oh, uh, outside of horror. Well, I, so Full Metal Jacket, I love, and Full Metal Jacket uh, does a good mix of songs and scores. Mm-hmm. So there's some scenes that are just like really eerie, and I actually kind of use as inspiration because I had to do the score for one of my short films myself, and I kind of enjoyed that song and kind of wanted to. Not copy it, but kind of use it as like an influence. But then Full Metal Jacket also has really great songs in it as well. So they mix it very well. I was gonna say Paint It Black comes in. Uh, oh yeah, that's comes in hot at the oh, end. Man, I think that's, that's so uh, good. And if I, you can move, your, if you can end your movie on that song, you're gonna do good. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's definitely. Um, oh my goodness. That just leaves you in a good mood. Scorsese, man, that's that. I mean, that's he's. Sco- he, did you mean to do that? Score, score, Scorsese. I thought you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, I, I mean, I just remember the first time I I went to see The Departed, and you get that cool opening, uh, cool opening uh, speech from from Jack Nicholson's character, and he's like, "I don't want my." You know, I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. And then, like, Give Me Shelter by the Rolling Stones starts creeping in, that opening riff, which is, like, arguably, like, the coolest Stone song ever. Like, one of the coolest yeah. songs. I mean, that just, I, I mean, I was just, like, Sets 30, tone. 30 seconds awesome. in, I was like, this is the most badass film ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what's so good about songs in, in movies is... Well, you gotta have money to get those songs. But uh, it really just sets the tone of, like, oh, man, it's gonna be a cool movie. And it really tells you what's happening pretty easily with what the song is. So, um, sorry to interrupt. I'm going to oh, cut you off real quick. No. So I was watching Terminator 2 again. And because compared to the first one, when you watch the first one, you're like, oh, Arnold's the bad guy and everything. And then T2, I mean, we've all seen it a million times, but you're not supposed to really know if you know Arnold's the bad guy in this one. You know, or you're not supposed to know he's the good guy. So... You're watching it, and he's doing the whole, you know, give me your clothes thing like he did in the first one. But then once he leaves the bar and he puts the glasses on and they, that Bad to the Bone song starts, you're like, okay, <laughs> yeah. this movie's a little bit different than the first one. And I'm in for a little bit different of a ride. And maybe Arnold isn't quite the bad guy that we think he might be. Yeah. So, um... It's a corny song, but man, it works in that movie really well. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, it, so, and it kind of works. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's kind of like a little corny, but kind of cool at the same time. Um, I mean, I think like another really good example is, I mean, is anybody ever going to listen to that Urge Overkill song that's in a uh, Pulp Fiction without ever thinking of you know oh, Uma yeah. Thurma Dan? It's like girl, boom, yeah. boom. There's I certain mean, songs are just I, like, I ruined mean, for me. I'm, uh, not ruined, but like. I will forever associate with the movie now. Yeah, and it, I mean that's sure. I think that's interesting territory artistically for for musicians to navigate. I mean, I mean obviously it's it's cool to have your song in a scene like that that's so iconic, but I mean at the end of the day, you know, to to create a piece of art and then kind of have it, I guess, you know, it, it it's People just don't see it as yours, you know. It's part of this bigger thing, which I mean, I, I guess yeah, it the person, yeah, but. you're right. It kind of becomes it's bigger than you now. Yeah, you know, it's not just your song that you wrote. It's like, oh, that's a song from Pulp Fiction. Now, because I, I would so. be, I would be hard pressed to, I don't know. I just don't think too many people would know who who sang that song, but they could immediately tell you like where. Yeah, in a way, it takes it away from the artist a little bit because now it's associated with Pulp Fiction. But then, it, it, but then it immor- immortalizes it too. So. You get that. But man, I hope to make a movie where somebody hears the song and they're just like, oh, I know, I know what, I know what movie that's from. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, Ooh, I thought that was the nitty gritty. Oh, I, I mean, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the nitty gritty, I guess. Ah, okay. You're, I, you don't have to do it in any particular order, but give me your, your top three film scores. Oh, I'm going to cheat. 
No, it's cool. If you got a, if you if you got if you got a list, pull it up by all means. I have a list. So um, top three limiting me. Um, oh, so one of them is the Terminator. I know we keep talking about Terminator, yeah, but dude, Terminator's classic. Yeah, I just I was like rewatching it the other day, and I'm like, man, this score is so good. It's a little dated, I guess, but. It's not dated anymore because now that style is becoming very popular again. The whole synthy stuff is having a resurgence, so now it's modernized, I guess. But man, that's a such a good score because uh, it's a sci-fi horror action movie. Like, how do you score that? And they do it perfectly. It's got this weird sci-fi sound to it, and then it's got like really terrifying stuff with the horror, and it has really good. Um, like chase music, and then the, the the theme of it is beautiful as well. So it's got that like iconic, you know, main title sequence sound that you want, and then it has this, the great score along with it. I mean, Terminator is just one of those. The first two are, I mean, there, there's obviously you can see when you know when things age a little bit, but I I think the overall concept of Terminator and just the they're just so well done those first two that I, I mean I I. I recently watched them probably about a year ago through like the whole COVID thing. I was born when I checked them out, and yeah, they just—it's it, remarkable like how how well they still hold up. I mean, they're they're dope yeah. movies. They're really. I was really, looking it up. Terminator Two is ninety one. I it's, it's and insane. And, it, and, and dude, and you think about like what they were doing with the the special effects and stuff. And, yeah. I mean, it's it's remarkable. And it, I mean, you have to look at a movie like The Matrix the same way too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, that's a man. Those movies are old, and it's like they. Really hold up. Yeah, I mean, so the Matrix is twenty years old, I, like older. Really? I think it was ninety nine, so it's nice. like twenty two years old. Almost did a spit take right there. Hey, you know, it's. Uh... I'll aim away from that. <laughs> so. Uh, so Terminator. Yeah, uh, Terminator. Uh, Full Metal Jacket is really nice because they give right. you these. Oh, man, it's just it's just got such a fun, which is weird because you know Full Metal Jacket's a pretty intense movie, but the sound score is so fun. You have a good time with it, you know, and you kind of because from what I've heard is Vietnam's a little weird. It's like really a horrible time, but then there was a lot of fun to be had during the war too, from what I've heard. And uh, Full Metal Jacket kind of brings you on that ride of like there's terrible stuff, and then there's like there's some like really fun music, and it kind of livens it up a little bit, and it it sticks with the time too, so it kind of gives you a feel of like what generation we are in during that, you know, during the war and stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I don't want to get too political or too far into it, but I mean, no, I mean, it was, it, it's a crappy conflict. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. Korea even before it, but I mean, those are wars where we start fighting, you know, basically mercenaries. Like we're not fighting like the yeah. actual government. We're fighting people yep. in their element. And, uh, and yeah, I mean that's where you just I mean, I don't know. That's uh Kubrick just had a way of painting uh of just painting a, a dark picture in a it just in a captivating way that like you can't help but like look away. I, I yeah. like I don't know. Like it just I love that movie. Yeah, I mean it's it's t- it's not one that I watch often. It's phenomenal, but it's like at the same time it's the first half of it and the second half. It's tough to watch. I mean, yeah, everybody like is always just all about the first half. I think it's a great movie all the way through. I mean, the most iconic and memorable part is the you know boot camp, but it's only like forty five minutes in the movie. Tons of good good stuff. Right. The and then um, third third score. What are we doing? Oh, uh, so under the skin. Do you know that movie? I Horror don't. film. What? Uh, under the skin. No, we're going. Uh, we're going. Scarlett Johansson. She's naked in it. Um, that's cool. Beautiful woman, and that movie <laughs> Absolutely is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, while we're man. while we're sounding like two lonely douchebags on ooh. Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh yeah, good time. I'm like, ooh, oh man, I've said boobies like a million times. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson, I we we both respect you as an artist, but you're she just is great in that movie too. Under the skin, man, watch it. It is a great. She horror she film. is a phenomenal. Actress. And the music score, it's you know no vocals. It's just. It's just creepy and slow and intense. It's beautiful. It really uh, captures the movie, like the tone and everything. When you're watching, it's just perfectly paced with the movie. It's really great. That score is really great. So I'll give you another one. Have you uh, Highlander? Highlander, yeah. Yeah. So it's scored by you know Queen. It's great, and it's it's specifically scored for the movie, which is interesting because I'm used to movies finding music that's already exists and then 
you know, making it or just scoring it like a, like an orchestra, like Jaws or something. Like, you know, yeah. they, just, they just score the movie. But with, you know, the Queen soundtrack, it's like, just they just made some songs that were going to fit the movie. And I think it's great. It's a little, no, it's great. What am I talking about? It might be a little dated <laughs> or whatever, but, oh man, it's so good. It just really captures the, like, excitement of the movie. It's great. So mine are, uh, mine might be a little mainstream or generic or, I don't know. I thought mine thing. were mainstream. I, I mean, you threw out, you threw, threw out that Scarlet Under the Skin Johansson. is you pretty, threw out Under the skin uh, there. yeah, Under the Skin's pretty hard. Uh, yeah, mine, mine might seem a little generic and, I don't know, I might get a little flack for this, Ooh. but uh, Jaws, Jaws is definitely. That's totally great. Super iconic. It's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. It's just, uh, dude, I mean, just the combination of Rob Scheider and. Robert Shaw. They, they work together Richard so Gray. well. I mean, the, those, so good. those three guys just yeah. phenomenal together. And, just watched uh, it recently again. Yeah, and, oh, and just so the, the the tension and the anxiety that mm-hmm. that... I, I mean, it's just so simple, but just... Well, music is super important in that movie because with all the trouble they had with the shark, it's like, you can't even... They could barely show the shark in the movie. So, music, it was like, just, you know, it was a necessity... Well, you bring a uh, you bring up a great point there too. It's like I mean I I'm I, I want to do that. <laughs> it's why I mean I I love Orson Welles, um, and and he's a a really good example. Um, I think of um, oh gosh, what's his name too? Um, Robert Surtees, the guy who did the uh, the cinematography for The Graduate. And oh yeah, a great movie, phenomenal movie, and it's been too long since. Yeah. Dude, and and just. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's really cool the way, like, I, I'm going to pick on Transformers, you know, it's, it's really cool to... The animated series? Dude, the, the or, or like the, okay. yeah, the... <laughs> you're, not, you're not talking but, about that. The, the newer movies, <laughs> take your pick, whichever one, the Megan Fox ones. Ah, okay. You know, the, the crummy ones. <laughs> Do you remember the score at all now? No, I mean, I'm not even talking about the score. I'm just like... I don't remember dude, anything about that movie. I just, I remember the special effects. Mm-hmm. It, it's all, I mean, I mean, I, I feel like... It's it's like a strobe light half the time. It really it, is. It, 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 like it's just brutal to watch. Coming at you. And then special effects are cool, but it's some. There's I mean, there's something to be said about a filmmaker, and especially you know older filmmakers that didn't have these resources and the ways, the the methods that they had to to utilize to to film certain things. Like, have you ever seen the movie RKO Two Day One? It's about the it's about the making of. Is that Sid- new? Uh, so it's probably like twenty years old. It's about the making of um, Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane, yeah. I just heard about that. Yeah, it's like uh, days ago. Liev Schreiber plays Orson it's Welles. Twenty years old. Yeah, dude, it's it's been around for oh, a while. I thought yeah, it was like a, a new movie that just came out. Uh, okay, I heard good things. Yeah, no, dude, it's phenomenal. Uh, John Malkovich plays Herman Mankiewicz. I, I think that's his name, yeah. Herman Mankiewicz, the that's guy who cool. co-wrote it with her. Yeah, dude, it's a it's a great movie. But there's this there's this great scene where they talk about um, the the scene where. Um, Charles Foster Kane walks into the newspaper room and the camera's like looking up at him. I don't know why I knew exactly what scene you were talking about. Be, uh, dude, the low but, angle where they're looking up. Dude, like could, really, I, are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, iconic and the, scene. Dude, it says a lot about like what those guys did as, as filmmakers. Yeah, I mean, it gives him like a lot of power in that shot. It's very cool. It's amazing. And so uh, in the film, they tell the story of like he basically like. Tore up the floor and dug a hole to get that shot because he couldn't get the camera low enough. I think I have heard of that. Yeah. That's really cool. And do they uh, explore that in the in that title that was very hard to remember? Yeah. Uh, what is it? One more time. RKO two eighty one. It's, oh, it's the name. It's the name of the studio. Wow. Yeah. They, they needed to retitle that. One. Yeah, it's not. It's the... cool once you know what the what it is about, but <laughs> it's, it does it, not roll off. It's no, and it's it's super esoteric unless yeah. you uh, unless you're a fan. Um, let me, uh, let me finish off my list here. So Jaws, um, dude, Jurassic Park. Yeah. Uh, and again, with those, those, anytime you have a movie where you hear just a couple beats of the theme and it's easily recognizable, you know how great it is. And, uh, and it's just, I mean, I think I saw it like. And it gives you that adventure feeling and that like, it's uh, like, it really like when you're, when that helicopter is coming down and they're landing on Jurassic Park. It's like that music comes in. It's like you know that you're not you're not scared yet or anything like that. You're just like, man, this is a wonderful, beautiful, uh, exciting thing I'm going to witness. And that music really encapsulates that. Yeah, like uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You uh, 
Taking the words out of my mouth, buddy. Thanks for doing my job. Thanks take, for I thanks for doing the heavy lifting, man. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to stick with Kubrick on my list too. But uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, beautiful you know, score. just yeah. Bum. And I heard, is that the movie bum. that? I'm pretty sure it's the same movie where it was scored by somebody, and Kubrick didn't like it, so he just threw in a bunch of um, uh, license-free, uh, you know, classical music. So, really. That's what I've heard, so All right. I'm sure people will comment and tell me I'm wrong. I swear that is what happened, though, and it's beautiful for it, but yeah, he just, he didn't like the score, so he's like, I'm just, you know, a control freak, but... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that wouldn't surprise so me, like, can do that. Based, on, yeah. based on stories that I've heard about the guy. All right, so we're going to switch it up. Um, give, me, give me your top three films with just the, the best soundtrack, like music. Oh, 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 um, Goodfellas. Ooh. That's got a real fun That's got a score. really good sound. That's yeah, a good choice. A fun, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Man, yeah. Thank you. Uh, two, what, what, what are you going to more? Say? So just like, we're talking about like songs, not scores, right? We're, we're talking about like, just songs. Like, which, yeah. which, okay. uh, oh, I guess oh, which, oh, oh, uh, Detroit Rock City. <laughs> Sorry. No, man, dude, dude, don't be so, that's, that's an amazing, that's dude. an amazing choice. And the, the music in that is so fun and good. I love it. Dude, who's in that movie? It's like, uh, man, there's a lot of people. Uh, who's the dude from, um, it's Edward, Terminator. Edward Furlong Edward in the movie. Furlong. Yeah, which is really cool. Isn't Steve Buscemi in that? I feel like I'm I saying that just because he's in Airheads. Oh yeah, he is in Airheads. He's right. in Airheads. Uh, yeah, he's I'm not, not in Airheads. Airheads is yeah. funny. That's a, that's a pretty decent film. Yeah, um, Detroit Rock City, man. That music just makes you like just want to be like, oh man, I want to be a kid again, and I want to go party and go to a Kiss concert. Are you yourself a fan of Kiss? Um, well, I don't like having their albums, but I definitely li- like some Kiss. All right. Yeah, and if I was at that, if I was born at a younger age, I would have been totally in a Kiss. Like, uh, yeah, how much fun would they have been in, to be into? You, you know what, man? Face up and go to Kiss concerts. I think that would have been so cool. I've I've always I've always said that. Um, like they're one of those bands. They fall into that category of like they put on a, a solid enough of a live performance. Where I'm not a fan of their albums. Yeah, but I don't think I would like their album work. It's just that that they're so cool. And you know, like you said, like their live shows. It's like that would be enough to get me. If yeah, if someone approached me with a free ticket and was like, "Do you want to go?" I'd be like, "Hell yeah, absolutely, yeah, okay. <laughs> absolutely, I want to go." Yeah. Um, all right, and then uh, your third. Oh man. Uh... Boogie, I don't want to say Boogie Nights because I Dude, really like Boogie could, Nights. You could say Boogie good. Nights because oh, that soundtrack okay. is dope. Because I just listened to it, but it was, about, I mean, I just watched it, but it was like, the sound score is really good. I had it on my list of... Uh, it's just like fun music, and and what's good about that is because the movie transitions from the 70s to the 80s, and the music is pretty important for that because it helps you helps guide you through, hey, we're in the disco period, and at the end of the movie, we're doing... Lots and lots of drugs and uh, fucking messing our life up. Am I allowed to curse? I I think I, I so I encourage people not to. Oh, but I don't um, think I did. I finish that F bomb. Well, see, here's the thing. So th- we're trying to keep the show like a PG thirteen. Because I don't think I cursed yet. So we're trying to keep it like a PG thirteen movie. Which I mean, I think you're allowed an F bomb or two in a PG thirteen movie. One, right? right? One or so two. Far. So our rating systems are so weird. I'm, I don't think I've cursed yet, which is I, impressive. I, no, you've all. you've kept the filter on nicely. I, mm-hmm. I appreciate that. And yeah, dude. I mean, yeah. we're. We're 50 minutes into this thing and... No cursing. Food, yeah. First F-bomb is not bad, so whatever. I'll Sweet. take it. Um, I, no, I, no, I think Boogie Nights is an exceptional choice. It's a great movie, too. It's uh, It really is. It's, it's so fun. I'm surprised how many people haven't seen that movie Like when I when I bring it yeah, up. Yeah, I know. Me, too. I mean, it's, it's like, it's so fun. Why would you not... And it's about like the porn industry. It's like, how could you <laughs> avoid that movie? Speaking of, uh, we, we, we lost Larry Flint. This week, I was very. Oh, did I, you? I thought we lost him a long time. Dude, I, I had the <laughs> same thought. <laughs> I was like, I assume you've been dead for a long time. That's I impressive. This, he must I, be pretty old. Dude, he was. Uh, I think he was seventy-eight. But um, you know, speaking of, uh, rim, I, he must have lived a happy, cool life. Well, I mean, like, I mean, not really, because he got shot like thirty years ago. You know, man, I don't keep up. I mean, did you did you watch the movie with Woody Harrelson? No, I guess I should have. What's it called? The People versus People Larry versus Larry Flint. Flint. Yeah, it's all about. Uh, Is it good? Should I watch it? Dude, it's been a while, but I remember it being good. And yeah, it's just like all about the the controversy between uh, I mean, him and Mr. Sounds, Jerry Falwell. That's very interesting <laughs> subject matter. So I should watch that. I mean, I mean, he's. Uh, I mean, whether or not you uh, you agree with what the guy made. Uh, 
I, I think that I think that I think the point that he was trying to make resonates a lot with a lot of people right now as far as just First Amendment freedoms and yeah, exactly. And just, Man, that's yeah, just the right to say whatever the hell you want, you know. Yeah, I like movies like that that you can still now today we can still relate to it. You know, there's always keeps going. Yeah, right. I'm gonna have to I have to go back and rewatch the People versus Larry Flint. Yeah, well, I'm gonna have to watch it. That's an oldie but goodie that uh, that I've got. A, I um I got mine in front of me here. Uh, I'm gonna go. Oh man, so. It's so funny because, um, you know, Mr. Lucas, everybody just thinks Star Wars, but American Graffiti. Oh, has, yeah, that's a fun, cool has soundtrack. Has amazing it soundtrack. It really does. So I think... That's one of the... That's a big time... A good answer. Dude, but, I think uh, I think it's like 40 songs or something like that. It's <laughs> it's huge. It's a big but one. But I think if you... I, I think that's like a big time one. That was a real selling point of it at the time was the score of that movie. It was so good. The soundtrack. The um, speaking of big ones, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna say Forrest Gump, mm. uh, and that's another example of bringing you through the different time periods, as yeah. like Boogie Nights does. Is it kind of progresses you through that? I, I love that point. I, I think uh, you know, as as a filmmaker, the you know, there's a lot that you do to tell a story without necessarily doing it through dialogue. And, yeah, and for you, sure. You you really should. You know, that's like a. Um, yeah, that's something you should try to do is like, how can I tell this without just telling you it? So through like music and yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think uh, I, I like the, I mean, people talk about cinematography and and all these other aspects, but yeah, no, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, you're probably the first person that I've heard really point that out. It's, I mean, I think it's something that I've thought of subconsciously, but yeah, you know, like, I mean, it, it, I'm glad you pointed it out because it's, it's a fantastic point. Uh, Thank you. And then uh, my oh man, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna have to pull the trigger, I'm gonna probably say uh, Purple Rain. Never seen it, dude. So everybody says that Purple Rain is such a bad movie too, and I don't think it is. I think Purple Rain is awesome. Okay, because that makes me want to watch it. I think it's one of the dopest because I like a lot of movies that people say are terrible. So, dude, I it's Purple Rain is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm imagining the cover of it right now. It's Prince. In my it's head. <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. Prince it screams Purple it's Rain. Badass, honestly. man. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, coming in, uh, I, I want to do an honorable mention because I, I think uh, if there's some fellow nerds out there, you're probably know this. Do you ever watch uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the, the TV show? I watched like a season. And I liked it. It's, I don't know why I didn't keep going with it. It's amazing. It's probably like my yeah, it was really favorite fun. TV show yeah. of all time. Nice. But the musical episode, I think it's called Once More with Feeling. And they actually just released a vinyl package wow. of all the original music that they did for this this one episode. Pretty cool. It's, uh, That's it's a lot like, of work. Dude, they just did a bunch of original music for one episode. Well, dude, so it's uh so it's arguably like one of the coolest episodes of TV ever. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a Halloween special. That's cool. And um and it's just phenomenal, man. Like if you and the episode stands on its own alone. Uh, you know, like you, it, you don't really know, like need to watch the whole series. Oh, to, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, you can just go and watch it, and it'll be it'll be fun as hell. And I mean, if you've never seen that, you should definitely check that out. Well, we're getting to uh, getting to that point of the show where uh, I want to talk about uh, just some some anniversaries and uh, some other uh, some other house house cleaning stuff. I guess um, we're going to. Uh, oh my goodness! So if uh, we were we were both fairly young in the uh, in the mid nineties, uh, yeah. nineteen ninety six. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but yesterday is. Uh, let me pull this up here. Yesterday is not only the twenty fifth anniversary of Tupac, All Eyes on Me, but Ooh. also the twenty fifth anniversary of the Fugees, The Score. Those albums came out on the Damn. same day, February thirteenth, nineteen ninety six. Yeah, pretty wild. It was yeah. uh, like big time East Coast, West Coast. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know. I mean, when it comes to do you, do you listen to a lot of hip hop? And I'm sorry, in East Coast or West Coast? Uh, <laughs> uh, I listen to hip hop, but yeah, I uh, I go both I, I go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> I go both ways when it comes to hip hop. If you had to pick a, a coast, are you? Are you I would go coast? West Coast. West Coast. Yeah. I man. West side. I I just. I got the ring right here. Represent. I gotta, oh yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> I love that. I gotta ring. go with. Really cool. I gotta go with East Coast. I, yeah, that's a big factor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm an Arizona boy. I've always been on the West Coast mostly, but I, I don't know. I like East Coast hip hop. Nice, really, I like uh, it. 
you know, to, to each their own, I guess. Um, we're looking back, uh, oh my gosh, 40 years now, celebrating Face Value by Phil Collins. It's the 40th anniversary of the release of that record yes. put out on February 13th. You know, uh, I, I believe it's his first solo record, and it's, it's the album with uh, everybody's favorite, you know, drum fill on it. Yeah. In the nice. air tonight. Boom, 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 boom. It's That's uh, a yeah. really good air drumming song, dude. It's it's arguably I think everybody's favorite air drum. It, I, uh, yeah, I would think it probably is honestly it, number one. It changed the air drumming game forever. Oh God, mine <laughs> for sure. Next level. <laughs> Inspired me on whole nother levels. Speaking of uh, speaking of uh, artists on that level, uh, let me see. I got a uh, another story here, and I'll pull this up. I'm so glad you're in control of the computer. Hey, you know what? I'm going to sit here and I, man, watch you I'm, do it. I'm trying. It's not going as well as I necessarily would like to. Still trying. I, I wish I had a couple of monitors really is the uh, is the big thing. No, more monitors the better. I keep watching these movies where people are at a desk and they have like that six monitor thing. What would you put on six monitors unless one of them is a video game or something or a movie? It's... Six six monitors. What would you possibly having to do? It's, How many monitors, dream monitors, would you want? It's man. It's maybe too Three? much to keep track of. I don't know. Three would do it. You think two? Maybe three. Yeah. Three. I think three. You could probably do some cool stuff with. Um. So, anyways, uh, wrapping and wrapping things up tonight. I I just wanted to say too. Uh, Milford Graves passed away this week, which was uh. Which is really unfortunate. Uh, definitely a big time pioneer in the drumming world. Hmm. Uh, he basically, he, I, don't, I don't know how familiar you are with him, but he basically kind of shattered the idea that uh, drumming is uh, just there for timekeeping. And uh, oh, that's pretty definitely, cool. Definitely like very free form, a lot of jazz inspired stuff. But very cross cool. genres. I know he worked with Lou Reed a little okay. bit from from uh, Velvet Underground, and uh, you know definitely was a uh, was a, a pioneer man, a renegade as far as the drum kit was concerned. Uh, Grant, I want to thank you for joining me, buddy. Uh, thank you. If you that was want to a lot of fun, uh, man. pitch your uh, pitch your film, tell us uh, if it, when when it's coming out. I guess if you have a time frame on that, or yeah, uh, uh, I mean, you know, we still, it's still got a lot of time, a lot of stuff to do, but uh, probably like four months or something like that, we'll have it ready for release. Um, yeah, follow us, Sweet Dreams, the movie on Instagram. You know, we post all the time, like a bunch of there's a bunch of photos, behind the scenes stuff you can check out. Um, yeah, that's about it. Right on, yeah. man. Um, if you want to check out some of my stuff, Movie Night Massacre, I have a YouTube show, horror reviews on movies and stuff like that. So, Right on, buddy. Well, I uh, appreciate you joining me, and it looks like we uh, we were live on this go-around. So yeah. I, yeah, I Woo! know, right? Live. Yeah, I hope we're you all back. enjoyed this episode of the Beat Sessions. I will have Keith Grenovitz in the house next week. We'll be talking about all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, Magic Mushrooms might be on the... Uh, Nice. Might be on the table for conversation next week. We'll uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, I I mean that's I mean we're getting ready to wrap up the show, but I'm sure you probably have some interesting thoughts on drug culture and, and music and the way it's impacted film. But oh yeah, Ma- mushrooms really. Uh, I love music, but man, mushrooms next level. It'll have to be a uh, a conversation for another time, my friend. I know it's sad. Dang. <laughs> Talk Thanks for first. <laughs> Thanks for checking out the beat sessions, everybody. I'll be doing uh, music reviews all week this week. We'll see you next time.